Hey everyone, welcome to the newest episode of the Not Your Average Joe Show. We're going to be talking about how to master the art of public speaking with my guest, one of my favorite guests I've ever had on here so far, Michael Gelb is in the house. I'm Joe Soto. Uh, Joe, well, I'm Joe Soto, and this is the Not Your Average Joe Show. I'll be right back with you. One moment. This is the Not Your Average Joe Show, where each week we bring you sales, marketing, and mindset strategies you need to get to your next level. And now, here's your host, international business mentor, Joe Soto. That's how people know this is live. I'm stumbling over my own introduction, Michael. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you. My name is Michael Gelb. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny because, and we'll talk about this because we're doing live presentations and we're doing live streaming, but I recently got braces. And I have not learned how to talk with braces yet. And I'm just putting it out there because some people are afraid to go live and do live streaming and because of how they might look or sound. And I am a mess with these braces. So I got braces. I, my orthodontist says, listen, in six months, we're going to have this all straightened out, literally. By the time you learn how to talk, we'll be taking them off. And I made him promise. And I said, listen, I'll do it. He goes, you're going to hate me for six months. I said, listen, I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. And I think there's a lesson in that which we're going to get into here uh, today. But uh, we have, um, and I, I know... You may not need an introduction to some people, but there's going to be some people on the show who don't know who you are. So I'm going to give you a, a quick introduction. So Michael is the author of How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci and several other best-selling books that we can showcase here in a moment. We're going to talk about one specifically, which is uh, uh, how to, uh, Mastering the Art of Public Speaking. And he's the world authority on genius thinking and one of the pioneers on teaching and helping people with creativity and also in the world of executive coaching. You're one of the first executive coaches that really started teaching and helping people with creativity and innovation. So um, as one of the leading authorities, I welcome you to the show, Michael. Thanks so much for being my guest. Thank you, Joe. It's really great to be with you. Well, listen, uh, years ago, I saw you speak at the ASTD conference and I learned how to juggle. So, All right, man. That's so awesome. Way to go. Then, what I did over quarantine was I bought these, I bought a few sets of these and I had my kids, I did a challenge with my children. I said, listen, whoever can learn how to juggle will get $20. And I have a, I have seven children, 17 and under in the house and 16 and under, he's almost 17. And I said, uh, "Whoever you'll get twenty dollars if you learn how to juggle." And I would play. I would pl I'd practice with you, and then we'd learn how to juggle together. And uh, my sixteen-year-old mastered it. My twelve-year-old uh, and my thirteen-year-old daughter has. They're close. They're close. So it's been really inspiring. And uh, you're one of the one reasons why we're doing that. So thank you again. Well, that's part of my life mission. So I'm I'm truly thrilled. Really, I want I want the whole world to learn how to juggle. Because it's just, first of all, it's just so joyful and beautiful and so much fun. And it helps us develop our coordination of left and right sides of the body, which also helps to coordinate the left and right sides of the brain and helps us just naturally become more Da Vincian. So that's so wonderful. Da Vincian. I love it. So let's get into it. So the, the topic, the we could talk about all kinds of things, obviously the depth of your knowledge base, uh, your work that you've done warrants about 50 of these shows. Um, but today you've got a new book out called Mastering the Art of Public Thinking. And uh, I st the, the moment I got this book, I started reading, outlining, underlining, um, and devouring the book. And I've been, you wouldn't know it from my introduction, speaking for about 20 years. And um, to say I learned something from this book is an understatement. I took a ton of notes from this book and I immediately knew that my audience would love to hear and be inspired by your wisdom that's in the book. I have a few questions that will kind of set us off in the right direction, but there's a lot of people who are wondering, you know, how do I maybe calm my nerves? How do I present fearlessly? How do I present creatively? 
Um, a lot of my audience are sales and marketing professionals. So we're going to talk a little bit about how you apply this to sales. But I want to start with the mindset, which is kind of how you lead the book off. This, prof this, this professional mindset, you call it, thinking like a pro. It reminds me of Stephen Pressfield's book, Turning Pro, which I really love, which was just on that mindset. You lead with it. Can you tell us a little bit about what this means and maybe how it helps people avoid the biggest mistake that they make in public speaking? Sure. And just before I do that, I just want to acknowledge you for demonstrating one of the real core principles in the book. Because all of us may get up in front of an audience, whether in this framework or a live audience of thousands of people, and voila, we got braces and uh, we stumble when we say our own name. And you, you, your authenticity in just being present with that, telling us that little story. I mean, I already liked you from our <laughs> conversations previously, but I felt my heart open. I felt like, what, this guy's for real. Uh, he's not trying to sell me something uh, 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 false. He's an authentic person. And, you know, one of the things we know is people buy on emotion and they justify with fact. They yeah. buy on emotion, they justify with fact. They decide if they like you. And if they do, then they really want to buy whatever you're selling. And if they don't like you, uh, they don't want to buy whatever you're selling. And what the research shows us is that people make that decision within seconds of you either coming on their screen or walking up on the stage or entering into a meeting room. So I just want to, I just want to, you know, as Ken Blanchard says, let's catch people doing something right. <laughs> Thank so you. Uh, deeply appreciated that. And yeah, think, thinking about public speaking from this professional perspective. So I can't believe how blessed I am that having come from a Jewish Italian family where everybody was talking at once, mom talking, dad talking, two younger brothers, all talking, talking, talking. So to get anybody to listen to you, you had to be quite forceful. And if you paused, <laughs> that was it, your time was done. So in Passaic Senior High School, you know how in high school they have best looking or most likely to succeed? Well, in my high school, they had class arguer. And yes, I won class arguer with my graduating class. I love that. But check this out. Two years later, my brother Ken also won class arguer. So that tells you a little bit about our, our family. Your family, yeah. So the fact that I found my way into becoming a public speaker, where I would go around the world, people would pick me up in a nice car, take me to a beautiful place. Someone would introduce me. People would applaud. They'd be quiet. They would listen. They would ask thoughtful questions. At the end, they would stand up and give me lots of love and applause and want autographs afterwards. And then they'd give me a big check. I just, I feel like I've been so amazingly blessed to have this career of 40 years of speaking publicly and getting paid for it. Now, many of my clients who I was working with over the years, I was helping them, coaching them on how to be more creative, how to be more innovative. But what became apparent was in order for them to get buy-in for their creative, innovative idea, they had to develop their influence, their persuasion, their public speaking. So I, it just was really simple. I said, well, instead of just thinking of yourself as a salesperson or a marketer or the head of research or a scientist or an MBA or a financial analyst or the CEO, when, it, when somebody asks you your job, job title, you'll think, okay, head of marketing, head of sales. But now you're also going to think, you don't have to say it out loud, but you're going to think professional public speaker. And here's what happens when you make this mindset shift. Because remember, public speaking remains the number one fear of the American public. Even during the pandemic. Right? 74% of people 
suffer from glossophobia, the fear of public speaking. It ranks higher in the book of lists than death. Public speaking is number one. Death is seventh on the list of, of fears in, in the book of lists. It means the average person would rather be dead and buried than have to give the eulogy. But if we put it to you that way, you'll give the eulogy, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so because it's, it's, a, it's, it's such a prevalent fear, because people are afraid of being embarrassed, the mindset a lot of people take into their presentations is, I want to get through this without embarrassment. It's a survival orientation. It's, it's unfortunately how many people think. But when you change to thinking, I'm a professional, that's why the book is called Mastering the Art of Public Speaking, because it's a lifelong process. I'm still on the journey. We learn what it is, is now we say every presentation is a chance for me to get feedback, learn more mm -hmm. and improve my skills. Not only that, every presentation I witness, I'm developing the discernment to understand what works, what doesn't work. Every time somebody tells me a good joke or I read an interesting story, now that I'm thinking as a professional presenter, part of my mind is naturally always thinking, gee, that's a story I could use in my next presentation. So it creates this effortless mindset of success that also becomes more and more fun and it really works. You become more successful. You build your confidence. The more confident you become, the more successful you become, and that multiplies over the decades in, in, in a wonderful way. So that, that's what I mean by think of yourself as a pro, and that's a big part of, of the early uh, section of the book. I love that. I love that. You, in, ending every sentence with inside your head, I'm a professional speaker or presenter. I'm hearing a little echo. I'm not sure why, but maybe it's my connection. I'm getting a couple of people saying my connection is a little blurry. Not cool. Um, you talk about the, you, in, at the end of the book, you answer a few questions. One of them is the biggest mistake, but you, sp you spend a great deal of time talking about preparation in the book. Let's talk about, because I see that also as one of the biggest mistakes people make is not being prepared. The more prepared you are, the less you'll have nervous anticipation. So let's talk about preparation. What can people do to prepare? You're absolutely right. Preparation is, is the key. It transforms anxiety and fear into confidence and enthusiasm. And you have a great framework you share for this. Do you mind yes. sharing that here? So the key is uh, everybody gets butterflies. We want to get them to fly in formation. And, and, and we do that by preparing. And the preparation really is simple is it's not about you. It's about the audience. So what professionals do is they say, who's coming? Why are we having this presentation? Why have I been invited to speak? What is the purpose? What are the outcomes that we want to generate from getting together for this particular event? So what professionals do, we write down what are our objectives for the presentation in terms of what we want the audience to know, feel, and do. So first is, let's say you're giving a 45 minute talk. What do you want to be sure the audience knows at the end of the 45 minutes? And the motto here, of course, is KISS. Keep it simple speaker. Yeah. Right. So the purpose of oral presentation is not to try to cover 197 fine detailed points. That's the handout that comes later. Those are the references that you give people if they want to check the background of what you're saying. The purpose of, of your presentation is to communicate Start with one thing. Start with one, one thing you want to make sure everybody gets at the rest of your, as a result of your presentation. And then no more than seven because that remains the limit of short term memory. Best to aim for maybe, maybe there's three things, 
you'll get across to people and you're going to write them down. What do you want them to know? The second part is critically important. What do you want them to feel as a result of your presentation? This is often overlooked in corporate settings. People are focused on data and metrics and KPIs and all that good stuff. But as I said before, people buy on emotion justify with fact. So we also know that emotions are contagious for better or for worse. So if you focus on the emotion you want to generate in your audience, you will embody that emotion and then the audience will be mirroring your enthusiasm, your excitement, your love of whatever it is you're talking about. I mean, you can tell I love talking about this. So I, and what's my goal when I talk to people? I want them to have a, a sense of excitement and almost like I just can't wait to give my next presentation so I can try all this out. And then what do you want them to do? Be specific. Obviously, you're a salesperson. Yeah. That's pretty clear. But be really specific, not just buy in general. How much, by when, and not just once, but for the rest of our uh, relationship until I retire, and maybe even after, and I help their kids, uh, and I deliver as much value as I can. And, and, and so, when you have, when when you write down what you want them to know, feel, and do, it, it does a couple things. First of all, it get it gets the butterflies focused. It gets you focused on the audience and benefits for them, outcomes for them. So you're not worried about yourself. You're just focused on being of service to them. And that transforms the nervousness into enthusiasm. And it stops you from getting off on a tangent or distracted in your own presentation because you're focused on where you're going and what you're doing, what the outcome and objective is in the time that you have. So in, in preparing for this, <laughs> and in not preparing for uh, the signal to go bad. And now we fixed the signal. And I apologize if it cut out for a minute. The no, the no feel, do framework. Um, I wrote down and took a shot at this. Can we, you mind if we play a little bit and you can coach me if this was good? So, and I wrote it out for myself for this episode. So cool. in other words, how do I prepare for an episode? I actually like this framework for preparing for all my episodes going forward because this is still a presentation that I'm helping to guide. So yes. the no, so this is how I did it. So everyone can be my critique and then comment in the in the comments. I said uh, I want people to know there's a mindset and framework that makes mastering the art of public speaking possible for them. I want people to feel relieved, confident, motivated, and empowered by the end of the show today, which I am no doubt they will. And then I want them to go to michaelgelb.com to your site and get informed, get signed up into your universe so they can get more genius insights from the global authority on genius thinking. That's what I wrote for my framework. A plus brother. <laughs> Thank you. I love it. I love the framework because it, it gives me a, a, a framework, a context to organize my episodes. And I think everyone can approach every presentation they, they do with this Framework. What do you want people to know? What do you want me? And you go into this in the book, and you richly go into this in one of the in one of the chapters. You give examples and paragraphs of understanding and really embedding this. And you, you know, so I had a little bit of an advantage. But, but but it's so simple. It is really simple. Just it. What we aim to do is take this art of public speaking and make it as accessible and simple and clear and step by step, and that is how it is designed. And first you get the attitude, the mindset of a professional. Then you learn how to set your objectives for every presentation. Then you learn how to make a mind map. Yes. So that you can remember your own message because it, one thing people are afraid of, everybody's afraid they'll be up in front of a group and they'll go, uh, you humana, 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 what was I talking about? Which by the way, is no big deal. You just ask the audience, you say, what was I talking about? And somebody will immediately say, say oh yeah, yeah, thanks. And they'll like you even more. So having said that, it's better to remember. <laughs> yeah. and, and the mind map not only helps you remember your message, but it helps you organize it and think about it in a much more creative way. What, what for people maybe who are unfamiliar with mind maps and you introduce mind maps 
throughout your books. Yes. I, I've got four of your books sitting next to me. This is not all the books I own. It's the ones I could find <laughs> handedly. Uh, you've got Discover Your Genius, The Art of Connection, which is like a sister book to yes. your newest book. And I would tell people to get them both <laughs> because connecting is everything. My favorite chapter in that book, I think I mentioned it to you, was um, The Rare Listener. Be a, be, a, be a Rare Listener, I think, was the actual title of the chapter. And um, you had a couple quotes in there that made it really, one by George Carlin that made it really memorable to me. So I remember that chapter really oh, yeah. sunk in. Funny how humor connects the memory, but that's, and you go into memory in the book. But um, for people listening who go, what's a mind map? Wait a minute. What does he mean by mind maps exactly? Can you shed some light on that? And maybe a, a resource, and I'll share a resource I have um, on this as well, but maybe where, how do people make them? Where do they make them? Sure. Well, yes, as you know, we have a mind map uh, chapter uh, summary uh, for each of the chapters in Mastering Art of Public Speaking. And then we have the whole book on a mind map that, that spans two, two pages. So you maybe show people. And yeah. so it's, I'm, I'm going to I want to show people how it looks. He, he summarizes every chapter with a mind map. And I found it extremely useful because I found concepts in the mind map that I overlooked in the chapter because I was reading through it too quickly or something. Right. Sorry. No, no, thank you. It's it's a multi-sensory, uh, brain-balancing way to take notes and make notes. So most of us grew up learning outlines or bulleting, top-down, hierarchical, slows you down, you know, you went to high school, a Roman numeral one. Uh-oh. Because <laughs> you're trying to put things in order before you generate them, which is, is, is a way to prevent creative thinking. Because <laughs> that just stop it. It prevents it. It prevents. It's not how the mind works. The mind doesn't work in, in linear top-down order. I mean, if you think about the last book you read or – webinar you attended or movie you saw and you wanted to write about it, you don't get an ordered outline in your mind's eye. You get images, impressions, keywords, feelings. So that's the natural way we think by association between images and keywords and phrases and, and, and emotional impressions. So the mind map lets us continue our natural process the natural way the mind works on paper. So you use colored pens. You see, I have them right here. And this is so thinking by, by the way, begin learning this with old, the old, I call it artisanal mind mapping with colored pens. Here, this is my to-do map of the day. I make one every day. I have my mind map, my marketing mind map is on my flip chart over here. Uh, so, I've written all the books with mind mapping. Awesome. Uh, right. And and I and so yes, I teach it in the books as well because I can tell you this. Uh, I introduced mind mapping to the United States in, in 19 from 1982 to 1984. I traveled around the US and I did a series of 3-day seminars called High Performance Learning. And that was the real introduction to a lot of people to mind mapping. And over the years, I've taught it to all my clients. And then we do it, use it for doing their strategic plan or their vision or writing their values or creating a marketing plan or a sales plan. And when I'm helping people develop their public speaking skills or getting ready for a presentation, which I, I've been doing consistently through all that time, I always help them make their message into a mind map. And if I think about the, the love and the gratitude that I've gotten from clients over the years, the unsolicited notes that people write to me, yeah. it's, I made a mind map, it transformed my experience of giving a presentation, it made it possible for me to think more like a pro, I remembered everything, it was more fun, I'm getting better at spontaneous, extemporaneous speaking because now I know how to think on my feet. Man, I love it. <laughs> and Dan says he was at 
the high performance learning seminar Dude. in Garney's old. <laughs> That's so cool. That is cool. So I, it's, it's, here's admittedly, I'm kind of embarrassed to admit this, but I'm going to admit it anyway. Um, when I read how to think like Leonardo da Vinci, I went on this rampage of doing mind maps thereafter and following your work. And I just got out of the habit of it. And I don't know why I did that because nothing made me think, give me, nothing gave me more clarity to, in or, to organizing my thoughts than doing mind maps because of how I, I'm scatterbrained anyway. <laughs> and so I'm like, that brought clarity to me. And then I went back to doing lists and stuff. And so when I uh, read your your latest book, the this one, and I saw how you mind mapped the end of the chapters, I um, have a new business project that I'm launching with a good friend of mine. And I said, let me do kind of a marketing plan for us. And then let's have a discussion. And I did it. I printed this out so you could see it. Oh, cool. <laughs> I did it <laughs> on the mind map. Awesome, man. And I have it splintered as uh, foundation, uh, the product, the brand, uh, the marketing plan, the revenue, opportunities, pricing strategies, bonuses, and the name of the product in the middle or the, or the, the project. And then we break it all down from there. And man, first of all, the speed of which I was able to put it together was remarkable in comparison to when I do an outline. That was one of the things I immediately noticed. He was he was really fascinated by. It. He loved it. In fact, I was using um, mind mind node. Let's see if I can get that spelling right. M I N D N O D E mind node, which is a for me it's a Mac software and it's I think it's free. And I brought him into it, and we were able to collaborate jointly on the mind map together, which was really cool from a technology standpoint because he's in England, and he's right. like. He's like filling in my mind map and it's changing right before my eyes. The version I'm like, this is incredible calibra uh, collaboration. And we're, we, we, he had, he was like, Oh, I love mind maps. This is great. It actually makes working on projects more fun, not just more creatively and, and the memory part of it and all that. So, thank you. Oh, thank you for, for that beautiful expression of what it's all about. And yes, the collaborative element is, is one aspect that I really love. O over the years, I've worked with all kinds of businesses and gotten people to focus on, for example, uh, creating a, a new vision, mission, and value statement for their company. I've done this a lot over the years. And the way I do it is I talk to them about what that means, what does a vision mean, what's a mission, what's a value, what's the difference, what's a strategy, what are tactics, what are goals. So you need to know what all those things are. Uh, and so we, we get people aligned around what all those things are. Then we have each person in the, in the group, and I recently did this with a group of 24 people. So we mix them by function. Uh, after first asking each person, and this was people from different levels of the organization as well, we ask each person, just make a mind map of your ideas on the vision, the mission, the values. What is important to you strategically? What do you think are the most important tactical priorities? What do you think are the top goals for, for the organization? So we, yeah. we encourage each person at every level to think like the CEO and to take ownership of the whole company in their mind. Now, what we then do is we put them in groups of four. So we had six groups of four and we mix them by function and seniority. Okay. And we put them in, uh, we have them present to one another in reverse order of seniority. So the most junior person presents their mind map first. And they usually do it and have a big flip chart. And the other three people listen and they're coached to practice rare listening. So they give their full empathic attention to the person. And this is probably the first time in that person's career that they ever had senior people really giving them total empathic attention, which already creates magic. Yeah. Uh, and then we, you know, we set a time based on the overall time frame. Let's say it's 20 minutes for that person to present. At the end of the 20 minutes, no conversation. We just go to the next presentation and we, we do rare listening. And then the next one and the next one. Now, magic has already happened because 
just if you the truth is if you just got people to be quiet and do rare listening with one another if they just talked yeah. it would already change it but because of the mind map and because we get people to draw pictures and images which show more about their creative expression people tune into each other appreciate each other get to know each other it's it's profoundly team building and the sharing of ideas by the time the four people have just presented is just greater than what usually happens otherwise ever. <laughs> then we invite them to discuss and share, and then we have that team make their consolidated mind map of their best thinking to share with the rest of us. Then we have six presentations, usually take a break after three, where you get 20 minutes and you present to all of us. No conversation, we just all listen to you. Then we have a big group conversation. Then we get six people, representatives from each of the teams, and they put it together into an overall master mind map. And from that, wow. magic happens for visions, missions, values, marketing plans, sales strategies, map your own life future, uh, your relationship, uh, whatever it is, your vacation, your dinner party. It's powerful yeah. stuff. I, I think that, I mean, and you would mind map out your uh, your framework on there too of no feel do as well, you know, because, oh, yeah. you know, if you're doing a, a presenting, a, doing a presentation, because one of my questions was, how do you make your presentations more creative and more entertaining? And that implies that creativity is something that can be learned and isn't something you're just born with. I mean, you talk a little bit about this in some of your videos as well. But how do somebody watching this who goes, you know, how do I make my presentations more engaging or more entertaining and more creative? What would you say to them? Would you obviously you'd say start with a mind map? Well, they, mind mapping helps. You see, each each step helps. So first, you think of yourself as a pro. So what yeah. makes pros different from people who are afraid of speaking? And they take on the responsibility of finding a way to make this engaging, entertaining, and fun. Yeah. Because they know that that serves the audience better and that they will have more fun. And then as they're generating, then they write the objectives, know, feel, and do. And then you say, okay, how am I gonna achieve those objectives? What, what's my content? How am I gonna do that? And you make your mind map and you, brain, you just go crazy. Your first mind map is messy. You go off, you just, what are my ideas? What could possibly be relevant to this? You just play with it. Yeah. And then th there's a simple thing that everybody can do. I've taken people who are really afraid of public speaking, committed introverts who are sure they could never learn this and sure they could never be creative. And there's a story in the book about, we were doing this presentation for the finance and benefits company of DuPont. And this was with the, the uh, the, uh, the, the finance and benefit committee for the DuPont Corporation okay. was, 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 this is a meeting that was held in the, in the boardroom in the Mont Shannon building uh, in Wilmington, Delaware. And these are the days of the old fashioned Dr. Evil type boardrooms. Uh, uh, so very high pressure. And my client was the pension fund and their goal was to become an independent business unit with DuPont as their main client. Okay. But in order to do that, that the people from the pension fund had to win the trust of the pension and benefits committee. Uh, and it wasn't just good enough for them to send their numbers and their analysis. Th these people are not going to transfer $8 billion to your management without meeting you. So, these people had to show up oh, and yeah. had to present. And they were they terrified. Had their A game on. Right, yeah. And they were terrified. So their boss, who's just one of my favorite clients of all time, he, uh, you know, he's the one who engaged me and said, we got to help these people succeed. And I said, don't worry, we'll work it out together. So what we did is our theme was simple. What do we want them to know? We wanted to know that we could get them better returns for less of a cost. In other words, we could provide better value. It was really simple. That's the main thing we needed them to know. Uh, the other thing we wanted them to know is that we had a value investment strategy, which is what their strategy was, yeah. and not a whole basket of strategies, which the people who are currently managing this uh, savings plan had. 
So we're clear about how do we want to feel the, 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 the real essence of it. They needed to feel confident. They needed to like us. Yeah. They, needed to feel they liked us and they could trust us. And what do we want to do? Give us control of the $8 billion. Okay, so this is real measurable stuff and a lot at stake because we needed control of that to demonstrate we could do this and then they let us go off and be an independent business unit. So just, just one guy. Uh, and the way I help them and the way this is helped for everybody is what's a story that comes natural to you? Like if I ask you, what's the best vacation you've ever been on? What was the happiest moment of your life? What's the greatest dream? Where's the place you've always wanted to go? How did you feel when you're, you, know, you saw your first born, born child for the first time? Nobody's an introvert when you ask them those questions. Right, they could just talk uh, about it. They're yeah. right in there and they're, and they're thrilled that you asked and if you're really present with them and listen, yeah. people all of a sudden they don't say, um, uh, well, um, uh, I don't know when my baby was born, it was sort of like, uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, blah, blah, blah. They don't, that's, they are authentic, right. they're natural, they're expressive. They're yeah. doing what professional presenters do. So I encourage people to find stories like that. And if they can't find them, we'll make them up that, that they feel natural telling. So this one, Brilliant. Right, this one guy comes up with a story. And it was actually not more than a story. He actually, this was a dramatic theatrical performance. And by the way, all business presentations are theater. Yeah. They're either bad theater or good theater. <laughs> right, right. So we're giving the chapter uh, with the name show business in it, I recall, it's, talking about business, setting the stage and business. it does all show business. All business is show business. Reaches into his pocket, takes a handful of change, and throws it on the board table. And he says to these honchos, how much money is on the table? Well, they look at him. Dollar fifty. What's the point? So we coached him for this moment. Okay. Take a breath and pause, because you take that breath and you pause, and people say, "Whoa!" <laughs> Not intimidated. All of a yeah. sudden, the power goes to you. He pauses. He breathes. He says, "May I respectfully suggest that you take a closer look?" So they're looking, you know, among the coins, and one of the executives says, "Hey, you got a silver quarter here." Those are rare. We don't see too many of those these days. So my guy reaches into his pocket and pulls out a magnifying glass. He hands it to the gentleman who happened to have the silver quarter. He says, may I suggest you take an even closer look? So now he's looking at it and he says, hey, this has a faulty mint mark on it. Oh this my is gosh. an extremely rare coin. Where did you get this? This is very valuable. And the other guy's saying, let me see that. And they're passing it around. They're all looking at it. He waits till they all look at it. He collects all the change, puts it back, and he says, just like our savings plan, an undervalued asset right here in our pocket. Let me show you how we're going to get the most value out of it for you. Boom. Boom. Okay, now then you have to back it up with the numbers and yeah. the charts, but he, that's he, he's the guy's a master at that. Yeah, yeah. but now yeah. he's got their attention, their trust. They like him. They like him. He's comfortable. He's yeah. smiling. They're smiling. And remember, our main goal is probably we need them to like us and trust us. And that just happened. And then every presentation was like that. We had we helped every person find their natural a story that they could share with which they felt comfortable. That's a great tip. Find your natural story. Let's dovetail into sales. So, which is one of your later chapters in your book. Yeah. Um, taking note from Buddha. Yeah. <laughs> Buddha gave sales presentations. I think it was, I'm going off a little bit of memory here, but I loved the, the way you laid out this chapter on selling. And let's talk about some of the key principles that somebody who's doing now, because especially since now the new normal, the new sales normal is doing virtual sales presentations and many people doing it like this or doing them over Zoom. Yep. They're now, their sales call is now virtual. It's not in person. They're no more going to these, you know, not as very, they're starting to open up a little more, but there's still, I mean, the days of going and setting up a booth at a trade show and conference has been maybe delayed and maybe even gone. 
uh, forever because now people can do it virtually. How do people use some of the strategies and techniques you have in the book? Maybe you share a couple of principles to be more effective at sales presentations. So that's where, thank you for mentioning the art of connection. And you're, you're correct that this really are uh, two volumes of one book. Yeah. Uh, the first volume is connect one-on-one. -on -one. The second volume is connect with groups, but it all yeah. begins with connection. The motto of this book is congiungere ad salvendum, connect before solving. And the motto of this book is congiungere ad orationum, connect before speaking. Love it. Right. So when we're in rapport, when we connect with people, when we're simpatico, yeah. they want to do business with us. But we're all pressured to be transactional, to get the job done, get the numbers, and we lose that human connection. And then we feel alienated or distanced by virtual media, which are obviously predominant at the moment. And this virtual media actually makes it even more important to connect with the people who are out there, even if you can't see them. So I've been doing these sessions on Webinar Jam with, with people all over the world. Yeah, and I, I, It's not like a Zoom where I'm seeing everybody pop up right? Uh, and I can talk to them. I just have to feel them around the world and tune into their energy and connect with them and always remember that I am here in service to human beings to enrich the quality of their lives. So your intention and your focus on the humanity underlying everything we're doing, and then you're just getting to know people, taking time. Like we took time, we met before the show. So yeah. we could bond, even though we bonded right away when we talked before, we, we, you, we took time to just connect and bond because everything flows better when you connect before speaking or solving. Yeah. So that's the first principle. And it just becomes more important since we can't shake hands or give each other a hug or buy each other a drink uh, uh, or go watch some fun entertainment together or do whatever we used to do, which mm -hmm. I do. That will come back. Uh, yeah. This will be uh, adjunctive more liberally than it was before. But I will be people can't wait to get back in co real conferences with real people and real sales shows. Agreed. It's all going to it's going to come back with a, just a huge enthusiasm. But in the meantime, this will be a modality that only becomes stronger and mastering this. Everything in these books becomes more important in these in these modalities. So that's the first and essential point. Then there are two acronyms that are covered. One, it has its own chapter, and then I tie them together yeah. in the chapter you reference. So the first one is, is PROPAR, yep. and it stands for the principles that organize recall during, let's say, a sales call. What we know from reams and reams of psychological research, well, it's intuitive. If I just ask people, if, if, if I gave you a, a, a list of 100 words, and we just, Joe, you and I just read them off to everybody. So right. don't take notes. Try to remember as many as you can. Which ones do you think you'd remember? The ones you're familiar with. Right. Well, what no. you, what, or the what ones you repeat, the ones that you, yeah. So you, the ones we that talk I, about repetition in that chapter is one of the key elements. So what we, we've, this test has been done over and over again. I've done it live with people in, in classes and, and researchers who are much more meticulous about this have done it. People yeah. remember the first few words in the list. Okay. Called the primacy effect. Right. That's right. Remember that which happens first. And primacy is the is the P in your of your acronym here. Correct. Yeah. People remember that which is repeated. If I yeah. repeat one of those words five times out of a hundred, you'll remember it. Oh yeah. People remember anything that is outstanding. That's the O in the acronym. So a story, a demonstration, coins on the table. That's the O. That's outstanding personally associated that's what you were referring to yeah in other words it, you're familiar with it. It, it it's relevant to you 
So you don't just tell a joke or do a drama to be funny or dramatic in your presentation. You link it to what you want them to know, feel, and do. Oh, brilliant. Got it? Yeah, so then, link the humor to that framework. Right, otherwise, it's a distraction. Yeah, brilliant. I missed right. that part before. And then, and then the <laughs> final R is recency. People will also remember the last few words. Okay. So in other words, make the connection first. That's most important. Then share the essence of your message, what you want them to remember. Find ways to repeat it. Think about Martin Luther King. I have a dream. And he yep. would, I'm have a dream. He said, I'm going to the mountaintop, powerful image, because yep. I have a dream. Now, he knew his audience. He was trying to reach out, get this. What do you want to do? Get the Civil Rights Act passed. How do you want people to feel connected around a oh, Judeo Christian yeah. heritage where you get the law from the mountaintop? He said, I see a little black child and a little white child holding hands in a field in Alabama. Right? So, you have to be a really hard-hearted person not to feel your heart soften with children holding hands. In it was genius. Why? Because I have a dream. Hallelujah, brothers and sisters. So you get your message. You say it in the beginning. You repeat it. You make it outstanding with imagery, the mountaintop. You make it personally associated. Yeah, children holding hands, and then you power it in again at the end. This is gold for everyone listening. You also demonstrated kind of subconsciously there the importance of the body language congruency as well. You talk about the power poses and you you reference some resources and some so that's kind of a controversial topic. I know, you know, the 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 power the power poses and the the whole, you know, I do a few of these once in a while. The but the congruency of him gesturing to the mountain that I, I call uh, uh, body language congruity. You had a different word in the book. What did what was the word that you used for? Um, you I call it body body message synchrony. Synchrony. Sorry, that was what was, I call it congruity. Synchrony is probably better. Um, Actually, congruence is also as very good. Term I use for it. Yeah, I love that because you're demonstrating how important that is when you're presenting as well, which is something that can make people more effective in selling. Which is when you're expressing yourself you know, you want to do so uh, congruently. Well, check check this out. So, okay. So here's a great sales story. Okay. I was in Sweden working with the biggest Swedish shipping company. And we trained all thousand people from the company in three day seminars, about 60 or 70 people at a time. First in creative thinking, mind mapping. And then we did a presentation skills seminar for them. And they were rolling out a new super tanker, which was gonna be the pride of their fleet. This was the firm, they built the, uh, the tankers, the refrigerated tankers that brought all the tropical fruit from Latin America to Scandinavia. And then okay. went back and got more tropical fruit, okay? okay. So, so we were, we were working with the head of this new division whose job was to sell these super tankers. And we were putting them on video so they could practice their presentation. And they were very thorough. They could tell you every speck of this. They were all, all had engineering backgrounds, but now their job is sales. So this guy gets up there, and, and I'm not kidding you. He goes, we have really big tanker. <laughs> So we have him on the video. I show it to him and his team. And I say, you know, tell me, uh, uh, Sven, do you think that uh, gesture is really uh, expressive of the pride of your company's fleet? So he's a good guy. He's got a sense of humor. He laughs. He says, no, let me try it again. So he comes up the next time. He psychs himself up and he goes, we have really big time. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> what? He's the biggest shipping company in Sweden. In all of Sweden, right? Mm -hmm. the, the CEO of this company was the Commodore of the Royal Swedish Yacht Club. I mean, this is big stuff. So it's hilarious because, he, again, he's a good sport. So now I taught him some of the energizing exercises that I are in the book from martial arts, yeah. from theater, which I've been involved in uh, for 
ever. And we got his energy really flowing, flowing. We got him to buy into the idea of going beyond where he normally felt uh, comfortable or familiar or habitual. So he got up there the next time and he went, the have really big talker. Mm. He gets a standing ovation from his people. <laughs> and look, Shakespeare said in Hamlet, suit the action to the word, the word to the action. So if you're talking about a really big tanker, yeah, it's a really big tanker, and yeah, it's not a, a really, not a really big, not a really big one, <laughs> not a big tanker. This yeah. is not a big tanker, right. and when you're on two-dimensional media, you need to jump out of the screen. You got to, yeah. without being overly distracted. You don't want to make you know distracting gestures, right? You make gestures that are aligned, natural, authentic in the framework of an upright, poised, open self, then you connect better with people, whether it's whatever the media. This is great. Michael, you also have a technique that you've trained for years called the Alexander technique, which I'm going to guess a lot of my audience will not be familiar with. And it's a technique that you shared for overcoming fear uh, and anxiety. I know, you know, people will resonate, are already resonating with you when you said it's definitely a fear that's real for us. And we listed number one. Um, maybe you could share with people what is the Alexander technique and, and what or what are some other things they might be able to do to help them overcome some fear? Because I think we still have some people that are shy to go live on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, or they're even shy just to record and post videos let alone being kind of shy when they get on to a Zoom with a client that they're selling when normally they wouldn't have this anxiety if they were in person, maybe. Yes. Well, here's let's just remember that the first thing is that it's okay to feel anxious. Professionals feel anxious. Yes, I agree all the time. You're just going to reframe that from now on as excitement. Okay. If you're not great. excited, you probably won't give a great presentation. Great reframe. Say, wow, how cool. I'm excited. Wow, I'm really excited. Yeah. <laughs> and, and before we get to the Alexander Technique, which is the method taught at schools for professional performers. They teach it at the Juilliard School. They teach it at the Royal Academy of both music and drama. And many of the, the leading performance arts schools in the world and many of the top famous theater and Hollywood actors are students of colleagues of mine have had many, many Alexander lessons because it is the trade secret of professional performers. But even before you get to that, I'll give you a, just a simpler tip. It just, it works almost every time for everybody and it's just the simplest thing in the world. Okay. Let's say you have a big Zoom sales call at 11 o'clock in the morning. Okay. Make sure you go and just do your, your most intense workout sometime that morning. Oh, okay. Just Work out, sweat. Prior. Prior. Uh, I mean, give yourself time, obviously, for a shower and so on, but right. you will change your physiology dramatically. You know how you feel if you're tight, if you're stiff, if you're worried, if you're anxious, and then you go on your Peloton and you do a super high level, or you hit the heavy bag, or you just pound those weights, or do your hot yoga, whatever it is, sweat. Because when you sweat, when you, when you activate running or hitting or punching or lifting, you're, you're metabolizing the stress hormones. Got it. And you're replacing them with endorphins. Wow. So endorphins is the feel-good feel chemical. It's the happiness right. chemical. Cortisol, adrenaline, norepinephrine, uh, the stress chemicals. So you, you're literally biochemically transform the fundamental template that creates your attitude and your demeanor. So if you worked out that morning and you really, really went for it, you know, you'll just come in, you're more, your body's more relaxed. You're more, you're more at ease. You're more present. So, and it just, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to read any books to know about that. You don't have to go to any other website, work out. You will feel better when you present. So that's, 
the simplest thing. Now, the Alexander technique. I love that, by the way. That's a great tip. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. So the Alexander technique really is, of all the things I've learned and studied, it remains one of the crown jewels of genius methodologies. I trained as an Alexander Technique teacher uh, for three years, many years ago. And my master's thesis about the Alexander Technique became my first book ah. uh, called Body Learning, an Introduction yeah. to the Alexander Technique. I'm pleased to say it's been in print for 40 years. Incredible. And just to tie some things together, when I was sitting down to write my master's thesis, I tried to make an outline and I was stuck. It was then that I learned mind mapping from the guy who invented it. My mind exploded. My ideas exploded. I wrote the thesis. When my thesis advisor gave me my review, when I got my master's degree, he said, I've never seen a student's writing improve so much in the course of my career. He said, it's as though you found your true voice which I did and became devoted to helping other people find theirs. So that thesis became my first book and that's how I became an author. And the topic, the subject was the Alexander Technique. And basically it was the book that I wish I had when I was trying to figure out what is the Alexander Technique. But in essence, what the Alexander Technique is, it's the art of being fully present and leaving out anything unnecessary in your body expression. Hmm. So it's, it's what makes, it's what you see in excellence in everything. If you look at, look at Roger Federer. I mean, I love, I, you know, I love Nadal, uh, Djokovic, many great players over the years, but Federer might be, the most poised of all. True. Right? Look at, look at uh, if you remember back to, if you can think of an image of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers together. Yeah. Utter effortlessness. Or any of the great, you know, Baryshnikov, Nureyev, any of the great ballet dancers. My wife's an opera singer. Uh, and one of the greatest singers in the world. And fortunately, you want to hear something really cool? What's that? So when I was working on my master's thesis, she was three. <laughs> when she That's was, awesome. When she was six, they discovered that she uh, had this amazing voice. Wow. She this career goal. She said, I want to grow up and be one of the great opera singers in the world. Yeah. She went to the Juilliard professional. She was on scholarship at Juilliard. She studies the Alexander technique because that's part of what everybody learns there. Her teacher gives her body learning my first book. Okay. He's that I'm teaching on a workshop in California. Oh my gosh. He comes on the workshop. What? We make this cool connection. We get together for something. I wasn't even presumptuous enough to think it was a date. I just thought this is the yeah. most exquisitely beautiful soul I've ever come across. And we're connecting. And we're connecting. We get together. We've been together ever since that first date, almost 16 years ago. Uh, so that's another transformational power of both Alexander Technique and mind mapping. <laughs> how, long, wait, how long ago was that? Uh, well, Deborah and I met 16 years ago. 16 years ago. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, and we've been together ever since. Uh, and Incredible. It's great to be quarantined with the person that you adore the most in the universe. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I agree. That is an awesome, awesome story. Um, we're out of time, but I, I want to keep going because I've got you captured and I just want to like, you know, share your knowledge with the world. If you are watching this late, um, despite some of the technical difficulties we had, I want you to watch it again. There's a lot of notes to come out of it. His newest book is Mastering the Art of Public Speaking. And you guys know I don't recommend stuff unless I know and feel and uh, genuinely know it can help you. And it's the book to help you in so many areas. You, I mean, We didn't cover the, your stuff on the vocabulary and memory and recall and the body language. We just touched on barely. It's so good. 
And then your other books, I mean, they can look you up. They can go to michaelgelb.com. Is this how they find you? Yes, but come to michaelgelb.com, sign up for our free newsletter. You can write to me if you have a question, michael at michaelgelb.com. Thrilled to hear from you. Yes, and get on his list. He's got a new program he's going to be releasing soon that really takes and elevates that opportunity to learn how to think like Leonardo da Vinci, the, the art of creativity to a whole nother level. You're putting that out soon. I can't wait for it. I heard you mention this on Ken Walls' show. He's here with us right now. And I immediately <laughs> went through and signed up. I'm like, I hope I'm one of the first people to learn about this. It is awesome. And Jamie just got done doing a presentation. She's on here. She says, this will be so helpful. She came on late. Uh, she just presented to tens of thousands of people online the other night uh, as a finalist um, on a really popular uh, internet marketing broadcast. So I'm really happy she's here. Michael, this has been awesome. Um, I appreciate all of this. You know, anybody watching this has picked up insights to help them be a better presenter. And for that, I thank you for just being here and being present for our audience today. Thank you, my friend. Really fun. And for everybody else, this is, you know, as always, my challenge to you to not be average. My goal is to continue to bring the not your average people onto this show. Michael is a living example of that. He's an inspiration to, to me and to everyone that he, everyone's lives that he gets a chance to touch. And for that, we're extremely grateful. I'll see you guys next time. Tomorrow we have, or the next show we have, John Asraf, one of the leading mindset coaches in the world with us. And uh, I'll see you guys there. Tune in next week for the Not Your Average Joe Show with international business mentor, Joe Soto. We'll